happy hour. Uh, I'm going to give a quick demo and answer a couple questions. Uh, so a lot of people have asked us, what do we do and what part of the process do we start in? So our whole workflow is essentially this diagram. We're basically a cat to print application where we can start by bringing in geometry, modifying it, and playing with it. So our whole goal is to help folks gain control over their CAD to print workflow. So what does that mean? It means by first being able to start by importing geometry. So of course we can bring in STL files, but why on earth would you want to do that? I mean, if you've spent all this time designing some beautiful CAD data, the last thing you should want to do is discretize it and ruin all the metadata. So we can of course bring in native CAD geometry um, and play with that. Of course, we can still bring in STL files. The largest STL file that we've ever brought was 10 and a half gigs, 225 million triangles. And the largest that we could theoretically bring in is 4.2 billion, but no one has ever requested that. Um, once you bring in this geometry, you want to be able to orient and position it. Um, after that, you want to generate some lightweighting and supports. This needs to be fast and sophisticated. After that, then you want to be able to slice this data. And again, by slice, I don't mean just necessarily slice the tessellated mesh. I mean, take the surface, do a planar intersection, get the parametric curves, and discretize on court height and geometric curvature. Um, after we've sliced it, and again, we can slice as an SVG, a PNG, or a CLI, or any of these formats, you then want to be able to generate the toolpaths and scanning strategies and exposures. And the whole key is, what I'm going to be showing to you today is what we call the Dendrite Additive Manufacturing Toolkit. It's basically an end-to-end -end added manufacturing solution, basically designed to streamline your workflow, make you as efficient as humanly uh, possible. Uh, the punchline to all of this is not any thing wizardly or magical, it's just mathematics. So at the core of any type of software, there's something called the geometry kernel. This is essentially the thing that does the mathematics in the background. And the whole idea is, well, the last time one of these was dramatically changed or written was in 1985. You know, over 30 years ago. And so what we've been doing for the last four and a half years is writing a brand new kernel completely from scratch. So, of course, making complex geometries is difficult. We recognize that. But we believe that the key core issue is iteration time. Right? We have some customers who spend 15 minutes loading in a file. Imagine doing that four times a day with 10 people in your team with a burn rate of 100 to $200 an hour. We're talking about wasting tens of thousands of dollars every week just loading in files. Of course, then the next bit is an unnecessarily complex workflow. We'll design something in CAD, export it in STL, fix the STL, add lightweighting, add supports, slice it, then pick it into your printer slice software. It'll tell you it's wrong. You'll go back, you'll fix this a few times, and eventually you might actually print something. Right? So clearly time's being wasted, but most importantly, you're losing quality. So to that, what we care about is efficiency. And there's no better way to show efficiency by just showing you a demo. So here we are at, and let's start by first doing something pretty fun. I'm going to first import a parasolid file. Of course, I could have brought it in an SDL, but let's start with something actually interesting. So we'll scale it down, we'll slam it to the plate, we'll then uh, zoom in on it. And you can tell that we actually have a parasolid because I can show you the wireframe. All right. So let's go back to seeing it. And because we have the surface data, we can then click this button, highlight any of the surfaces, and say, OK, let's not orient it. Then let's make a couple copies. OK. Let's zoom out. Let's grab the main parent they're all linked, they'll all move together. Let's rotate and translate them. All right. Then let's select every surface at a 45 degree angle. Let's see that from below. OK. Now here again is where not having a triangular mesh, but CAD data actually becomes important. If I had to select the triangles on this thing, you know, simulated, right, I'd have to select them one by one. That's awful. I don't understand why anyone would even want to do that. Right? What it makes more sense is to say, hey, this is a machine surface. Let's select that and remove it from the support dialog. Okay? So now that we have selected the surfaces that we want to generate supports for, 
And we could select all kinds of regions, by the way. I'm just doing one for show. We can then go and generate all kinds of supports. So let's go generate some trust structures. Then let's go slice everything. OK. Let's go view all the slices. And OK, we've done a basic kind of cat to print. In fact, even if you look at this thing, we can even generate some dummy tool pads for like a DMLS type process. Let's zoom in. Okay. But this is actually probably the most boring part of the demo. The most interesting thing is, in using this GUI, we've actually already generated a bunch of Python. So what does that mean? I'm going to go ahead and save and show you. Okay, so now we're going to close the app. And let's go to the tutorials. And so this is the code that I just generated completely from the GUI. And now all I'm going to do is I'm just going to go run it. So we'll launch the app, bring in all the files, generate the supports, move them around, slice everything, and then show. Right? So in the simplest incarnation, this is just like a macro. But in a more interesting kind of incarnation, because we have this Python code, we can start to do all kinds of interesting things on top of it. For example, a job shop can go build a website for analyzing things. An MES software can connect to it to go analyze lots of build jobs. Uh, someone can build a tool or an application to automate very specific, tedious, low-value tasks. And actually, the most probably interesting is the following. So here, I have this CAD design. Now a design change has happened. Oh my god, now I have to go do this again. What am I supposed to do? Well, I'll go close the app. I'll go into the design and say, I'm going to change this from crank one to crank two. So I'll then run it again. So we'll then lock the app again, except this time we'll load in an entirely different model, we can do everything again and slice. And you can see it's an entirely different model. Right? So again, the whole idea is to speed this process up as fast as humanly possible. Right? You're supposed to go from CAD to print in five minutes. You're also supposed to learn the software in five minutes to go from just left to right. Right? We've also emulated this by creating a feature tree. All right? Do you have any more questions? <laughs> ah, good question. Um, in terms of, for example, <laughs> hatching strategies, uh, rather than showing the specifics, I'll show you the toolpathing API that we're creating. So all kinds of folks want to do research. And the idea is there's not just one hatching strategy that people want. right? I mean, most people are probably familiar with checkerboards, stripes, and filling them in with zigzags. But the true answer is we wanted to create a toolpathing system that was useful for a variety of printers. right? So regardless of whether you bring in STLs or CAD data, you can bring them into our system. You can then get the polygon contours the voxel data as like PNGs or SVGs, or even the spline curve slices, because some printers can actually print the spline. You can actually convert between all of them as well. I can discretize the splines to get polygons, I can do a spline fit to the polygons to get the splines, I can rasterize these to get the voxel data. Right? It's not that one is better than the other. This bottom part is more of a binergetic DLP process, this top part is more of an FDM DMLS type process. Right? So once we have the spline, or the, sorry, the slice data, we can then go and generate zones. So we have up skin, down skin, in skin, or whatever other geometric values you might want. You then want to be able to translate and rotate those slices. You can then generate offsets inside and outside to compensate for the beam width. You then want to do slice level parameters. So you might want to change the rotation of the hatches at every single point or, or change the translations. And then it comes to the actual scanning strategy. right? So the strategies that most people are familiar with are checkerboards and stripes. In our mind, we wanted to create a macro strategy so that if you wanted to make elephants, you could pattern those as well. Then, once you go to the next step, which is what we call micro hatching, that's how you color it in. Again, you can use our library of zigzags and things, but the whole idea is that you could go develop your own. And then finally, we go to setting up the parameters and exporting it to the machine. So, our goal isn't to necessarily tell people how to do things, it's to create an environment where lots of people can experiment and try things. And if no, nothing else, just use the baseline that we provide. So everything about our software is 
but giving power back to the user, freedom to do anything they want, and control over their entire process. All right? Just because I have the audience, I can also show you one more demo. So I'll launch our app again. And this time, I'll show, for example, like a latticing demo. So the first thing that we're going to do is bring in this impeller. Funny enough, it actually takes a little bit longer to load the impeller than to actually do the light weighting. So the first thing we're going to do is bring this thing in. It looks pretty complicated. It's a VREP service. Just give it a second. Okay. Then we'll take this thing, we'll scale it down, we'll slam it to the plate, we will zoom in, we'll then take it and rotate it about the x-axis 90 degrees, we'll then move it up, and then I'll hit this light weight button. So the first thing that we're going to do is, it's going to analyze the surfacing system. So what you see here is it slowly going over the surface and analyzing it trying to determine where it can do these light weighting intersections and where it's going. Again, notice how the computer isn't locking up. Um, if you could hear it, you're hearing the GPU go throttling up, right? So this is all being analyzed in the GPU and trying to figure out where these intersections can actually take place. In fact, if I were to go and view it in a slice plane view, you can even see how that analysis is taking place. The beauty is that after it's been analyzed once, you can actually compute these structures over and over and over again very quickly. So we believe that the issue was not necessarily the structure, but actually just the iteration time. So you see it, you saw it kind of fill in. And now I'm gonna to go to the structure view, right? But you know what? I don't want this structure, I want something entirely different. So let's go take this gyroid and make it half as big. So you can see how it basically fills in and we're done. In fact, you know what, I don't want this gyroid, I want to go do something else, like a honeycomb structure. Let's do that. All right, and then show you that it's honeycomb by just going up and down. But you know what, I didn't like this honeycomb either, I'm going to make it even smaller. So let's go do that. Right, again, the key of this is iteration. Right, in a production setting, you need to be able to go over and over and over again to find the best result. So let's go view that again. Okay, you know what? I don't want honeycombs either. What I actually really want is a unit cell truss. Right, and again, the speed at which this is happening, so this is a one millimeter unit cell size, right? Basically the maximum capacity of most of the printers that we have, we can see at the show, right? The beauty of this is, this is all happening on this laptop. But of course, our software can work on Windows, Linux. It can work on laptop, desktop, air gap computer, and the cloud. Right? In fact, we're actually talking with a number of our OEM vendors to figure out a way to even put our software inside the machine itself to make it so that you can do things live on the machine and course correct and make it even faster. So thank you all for seeing this demo. Uh, I'll be around for a few questions. And there are definitely folks around this here who can answer more. Thank you.